is no, no clear front runner in the race. race. Polling, Polling shows, shows a majority of voters haven't made, made up their minds. minds. This field isn't going to narrow slowly over time like a presidential primary. This, this race is going from 17 candidates straight down to two in a runoff. The, the candidates, candidates have wildly different ideas on how to tackle Denver's, Denver's most pressing problems, problems homelessness, homelessness, public safety, affordable, affordable housing, and, and voters will also consider who's prepared to lead an enormous and complex city government. government. Tonight, our, our second of three, three debates. debates. We're live from McAuliffe International School in Park Hill. This is Nine News Presents, The Race for Mayor. Good evening and welcome to McAuliffe International School. I'm Kyle Clark from Nine News alongside my colleagues Anusha Roy and Marshall Zellinger. Candidates were invited to participate based on the results of a Survey USA poll commissioned by Nine News, the Denver Gazette, and MSU Denver. We invited all of the candidates with at least 2% support in the poll. As with each of our Nine News debates, we will not refer to candidates by your elected or educational titles because voters will decide who will hold the title as mayor. Candidates will have one minute to answer most questions tonight with rebuttals and further, discu uh, further discussion at our discretion. And please signal if you'd like to try to jump in uh, for a rebuttal about something that's said. We'll do our best, no promises, but raise your hand and we'll try to get to you. You'll also have the opportunity to do one of our favorite things now in our Nine News debates is ask a question of someone else. We have an audience with us tonight. They have agreed to withhold their applause to allow all of you the maximum amount of time to share your policies and positions with voters at home, with the exception of this moment now when they welcome all of you to the debate. said people aren't paying attention to the mayor's race. How about that? So, as we mentioned, this is a debate. You all have had countless forums and other opportunities, places where you can express your views for the city, but we really want to hear where you respectfully disagree with one another tonight so that it's clear as possible for voters at home. Tonight's questions were prepared by the journalists of Nine News. They have not been shared with anyone else in advance. Let's get started with opening statements in the randomly generated order in which you all are seated. Trinidad Rodriguez. I'm Trinidad Rodriguez, and I was born and raised in West Denver by a hardworking single mom. We face speed bumps along the way, things like uh, housing insecurity, violence, addiction, and mental health struggles. And this city helped us through the tough times. So when I started my career 25 years ago, I paid it forward by serving and helping our most efficient civic and nonprofit organizations to build uh, secure funding for schools, hospitals and clinics and affordable housing communities that went on to serve tens of thousands of Denverites. It was an incredibly rewarding career and Denver's in tough times right now. And I asked myself, what kind of city do we want to leave to my, do I want to leave to my daughter? And that's why I'm fighting for Denver for the, for, to, to be your mayor, to build the city that where every Denverite, regardless of the neighborhood they're in, can achieve their version of success. Thank you. Lisa Calderon. Hi, I'm Lisa Calderon, and I'm running to be your next Denver mayor. I'm a fourth generation Denver bar Denverite born to teenage parents. Uh, I also was unhoused as a teenager escaping domestic violence. But it was teachers who got me back into school and saw something special in me and encouraged me to continue. Even when I was a single parent, I could still afford a two-bedroom apartment in Park Hill on public assistance. That isn't the reality for a lot of young people. I'm also a college professor, and I'm carrying their dreams forward. Last election, 2019, I came in third because I took on uh, big corporations and our unaccountable city government. I'm proud to say that I am tied for first place because my 30 years as a community leader in Denver runs deep in our community. So please check out my campaign, lisafordenver.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas Wolf. I have a shout out to my dad. It's his 91st birthday today. Great dad to five kids. Hey, I, I entered this race because I listened to Denver voters and uh, public service is doing what voters want done. Voters want encampments to end because they're inhumane and what they don't necessarily know is that they're fiscal suicide for both DPS and our city budgets. Um, 
it's one of those things where it's a second order impact and it needs to be confronted and controlled. If you don't share my empathy that we can solve encampments through shelter and city buildings, please sh have empathy for teachers and students. Um, I, I come from an independent background that's, that, that isn't political, and I've been successful in the financial world by under-promising and over-delivering. And I thought that would be a refreshing approach to have as a Denver mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Hansen. Hello, I'm State Senator Chris Hansen, and I'm running to be Denver's next mayor because I believe we need to build a city that works. And right now, I'm feeling frustrated. Frustrated that Denver is not working for everyone. Frustrated we're not living up to our full potential. We need to build a safer, more affordable, and greener Denver. And as the only candidate on this stage who has been responsible and accountable to shareholders and to voters, I have the private and public sector leadership experience to take Denver into its future and write this next chapter together. We have to confront the homelessness crisis, we have to address public safety, and we have to make Denver more affordable as we build the greenest city in the entire country. You know, a couple months ago, I took my boys downtown, we jumped on the 15 bus, and I immediately started getting questions. Dad, was that a drug deal I just saw? Dad, why are we feeling so unsafe downtown? As a father, that's a heartbreaking conversation to have. Denver, I know we can do better. I'm ready to write this next chapter with you. I ask for your support in this important race. Thank you. Terrence Roberts. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Terrence Roberts. I'm running for Denver mayor because of all the issues that we just heard. We need to do something about our homelessness crisis. It is becoming a crisis in Denver and our violence. Most of that is youth violence. I grew up right here in Park Hill. My grandmother, Miss Ernestine Boy, owned a small business, a and Fish Market, 2896 Fairfax. We can do better for our small businesses. We need more public housing. We need a public banking system to pay for it in Denver. Everyone's talking about affordable housing. I support projects like the Fresh Low Project in Montbello. We have residents in Montbello who are coming up with their own ways to come up with affordable housing. However, besides affordable housing, in order for someone to get to affordable housing, they need counseling services, they need abuse services, and they need public housing, and then they can afford affordable housing. And then we can also make small business loans to our small businesses. Vote for Terrence Roberts today with your mail-in ballot because I have the clearest plan to move our city forward properly into the future. Thank you. Mike Johnston. Uh, thank you. Well, it's great to be back in school. Uh, I started my career as a teacher and a school principal, so spent a lot of time managing auditoriums like this. You all are much easier so far. Um, uh, I, I had a mentor when I first started uh, t uh, as a school principal who used to say there are only two things you can offer to children, truth and hope. And I think in some ways the city faces this same challenge, which is there are some hard truths we have to face. Those hard truths include tonight we know that 80% of the teachers that serve schools like this one and nurses and firefighters that serve this city can't afford to live in this city tonight. That's the truth. We know that right now, if you're a young person going to bed, you gotta look out your window and check to make sure your car is still there because you live in the city that has the most significant auto theft uh, risks of cities in the country. And we know that we go home tonight, there will be 1,400 people somewhere walking around Denver trying to find a place to sleep who don't have a home. The hope is we know these problems are actually solvable. And I have a vision to make sure that we can get back a Denver that we are proud of, that is vibrant, that is affordable, and that is safe. And I'm excited to talk to you about that tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Al Gardner. Good evening. My name is Al Gardner, and I'm here tonight because I want to be Denver's next mayor. I've been asked many times, why? Why now? Because I believe that everything in my life has led me to this point. I was raised to believe that the most noble thing that you can do in this life is to serve others. I've done that. I've done that by building an IT career that started at the bottom level and worked my way up through executive ranks. I didn't wait till I retired to, got, to get busy uh, with working with public works. I did it simultaneously. I've worked for multiple boards and commissions in this city. I currently serve on the Civil Service Commission. I'm not going to frighten you into voting for me tonight. There is a lot wrong, but we have done a lot right. And I believe that there are opportunities for us to do better. And that's why I'm running for mayor, to work with you, along with the Denver voters, to make Denver better and to move Denver forward. Thank you. Kelly Bruff. Hi, I'm Kelly Bruff. To solve problems, you first have to understand them. 
and I understand so many of the challenges people in Denver are struggling with today. I lost my father to violent crime. My family received government assistance when I was a kid to put food on our table and keep a roof over our heads. And my husband struggled with addiction our entire life together, and my girls and I lost him to suicide. But I also know the next mayor needs executive experience to be able to implement solutions to address those challenges. And I have that experience too. I was the first woman to be president and CEO of the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. I was John Hickenlooper's chief of staff when he was mayor of Denver. I was the first woman to head the HR department for the city of Denver. And if you saw my ad, I was the first woman to plow snow on call at our airport. I know this. I know the city inside and out. I'm running because I'm ready, and I'd love to have your support. Thank you. Andy Rougeau. My name is Andy Rougeau, and I'm running for mayor to fight for Denver's future because the people on this stage have failed our city. And look, it's a city I love. It's a city where I settled down after I got out of the Army, it's a city where I built a business, a city where I'm raising a family. I've got two little girls, a three-year-old and a seven-month-old. But the people on this stage have failed our city. Our mayor and our city council have failed our city. Crime is out of control. Homelessness is rising. Housing is unaffordable. We can talk about some of the horrible statistics on crime, like a tripling of murders in the past 10 years, the fact that we're one of the car theft capitals of the country. But me as mayor, I will make sure that we're adding 400 police officers. We're ensuring there's sufficient funding for police training. Our 911 system works. For homelessness, we've seen almost a doubling of unsheltered homeless in the past four years. I will enforce the camping ban to get the homeless into the mental health and drug addiction services they need. Housing is unaffordable for blue collar workers, young families, and first time home buyers. I'll change that. My name is Andy Rougeau. I'm a veteran, a father, a small business owner, and I want your vote to fight for Denver's future. Thank you. Leslie Harrod. Everyone deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Doesn't matter who you are, who you love, your income or your national origin, we all belong in this city. Denver is stronger because of us. Denver deserves a mayor who will put pragmatic progressive solutions to create real results for this city, to ensure everyone here is housed, safe, and secure. This is who I am. This is what I've fought for. I was raised by a single mom in the armed forces who taught me firsthand what dedication and service looks like. And when she struggled to take care of me alone, two people stepped in, a law enforcement officer and a woman who was a leader in her own right. This is my family. This is how I grew up. It may sound complicated, but it's not just like many of the issues facing Denver today. We can tackle our toughest issues, and we can do it together, because that's what families do. But for too long, special interests have really taken a hold of this city and run for their own interests, not the people's. When elected, if elected, as your next mayor, I promise to put people first and deliver real results for this city. I'm Leslie Harrod. I hope to have your vote. Thank you. Debbie Ortega. Hi, I'm Councilwoman Debbie Ortega. And I first want to take a moment to acknowledge the loss of a great political leader, Pat Schroeder, who was a congresswoman that served this, this state for many, many years. Um, I ended up in Colorado at the age of 13 after my dad passed away. He was a coal miner that was killed in a mine cave-in. And I've been here serving this city for the last four decades. And I've worked on many of these issues from how we have solved air quality issues like the Asarco problem, uh, cleaning up the soils of that community, to addressing housing affordability as the director of Del Norte Neighborhood Development Corporation, to serving our homeless population as the first director for the Homeless Commission. And I know what these issues are and the problems that we have with solvable solutions. I've worked on these issues. I believe I can make a difference, and I'm here to ask for your support. The experience that I've had really makes a difference in this race. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's begin by discussing leadership and executive experience. As mayor of Denver, you'd be leading a city of more than 11,000 employees with a budget of discretionary spending of more than one and a half billion dollars. Please explain to voters what experience you've had that prepares you to lead a large and complex organization. And please limit your answers to about 30 seconds. We will stop, start with Debbie Ortega. So first of all, uh, as a council person, I have had to dive through the city budget and bring forward changes that 
have resulted in amendments to the budget. So understanding the city budget is very important for the mayor who administers that alongside with their cabinet. Um, also as a board chair of Del Norte, I ended up having to take control of our organization when our director uh, was no longer there. So it was overseeing the whole administrative operations that included working with a property management company and the staff of that organization while at the same time running my own staff within the city. Thank you. Leslie Herrod. I'm proud to represent this district right here in Central and Northeast Denver at the State Capitol. Um, I have served as the chair of the Appropriations Committee and on the Joint Budget Committee managing the state's $40 billion budget. Um, this work obviously um, it's directly related to what I will be doing as mayor and managing the city's budget. But additionally, I created the largest mental health foundation in the state of Colorado caring for Denver. Thanks to all the taxpayers here, we now have a foundation that supports mental health and substance misuse for those living right here in Denver. We've given out almost $200 million to over 200 grantees in the city and county of Denver. I created that from scratch uh, and now we're operating for the people. That's how I'll lead as mayor. Thank you. Andy Rougeau? So I am different from many on the stage. I'm not a politician. I am a former Army officer. I deployed to Afghanistan with the Rangers. We were protecting Kabul from large suicide bomb attacks. I know what accountability looks like. I led a business. I grew it from 12 employees to over 40, offered good wages, good benefits. So I know what it's like to actually have to make payroll every two weeks. So unlike some of the people on the stage, when I make a promise, I will deliver on it. And I will not give you empty promises, empty words like too many of our politicians have. Kelly Buff. Uh, I was the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce responsible for uh, the entire budget and the operations with 3,000 members. Uh, I was the head of HR for the city of Denver where I negotiated some of the largest contracts, particularly around health insurance. And then of course, I was chief of staff for John Hinkenlooper. Um, the general fund then, which is the budget you're referring to of about a billion and a half today was $850 million uh, with about 10,000 employees. And that was the largest responsibility I've held. Al Gardner. In my career as an executive in IT, I've managed budgets, I'm gonna say from, let's look at two sides of this. We have the nonprofit side, which um, I've been an executive there, and it's quite difficult because you have to look at restricted budgets. So that means you have to be even that much more careful about where you spend money and how you spend money. On the corporate side, we have larger budgets, but there again, we're always trying to look around the corner, which makes you that much more dialed in to where you wanna go. In addition to that, the most important thing about a budget, I don't care if it's a dollar or a billion, is prioritization, and that's what I've had to do. Mike Johnston. Uh, thank you. Um, I've been the a CEO in different capacities for the last 20 years, from running schools to running nonprofits to running for-profit organizations. I think probably the way people would most uh, have seen my leadership is if during the pandemic, if you ever got a COVID test or a COVID vaccine, uh, I built the organization called COVID Check, which provided COVID testing around the state. Grew it from one person to 1,500 employees. We did more than 15,000 tests a day, helped vaccinate and test more than a million Coloradans, which meant people knew they could get regular, easy access to uh, tests and vaccines to keep them safe. I think that's the kind of high quality public services people expect and that I would deliver as mayor. Terrence Roberts. Yes, I uh, founded a nonprofit in the basement of my home um, that has raised over $10 million now uh, in community development projects. And we didn't raise it just through the nonprofit. I'm talking about the Holly project when it was arsoned. Now that's, that's over a $10 million community development. Um, I've spearheaded movements where we've gotten justice for victims of police abuse. I, I, I helped draft Senate Bill 217. 217. Um, we've done a lot of work, um, not just myself, but my team that's supporting me, so. Chris Hansen. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, I'm the one candidate on the stage who has been responsible to shareholders and to voters. In my 10 years in the private sector, I worked for a $15 billion global company called IHS, which headquartered here in Denver, had an incredible experience there working on billion dollar projects, running large teams all over the world, from Dubai to India to exotic Michigan. I covered a lot of ground in my private sector uh, experience. And then taking on the responsibility of being on the Joint Budget Committee and le helping to lead that committee over most of the last four years and managing a $40 billion state budget in the midst of the trauma and the ups and downs of COVID. So I bring both public and private sector leadership. Thomas Holt. So my work is in the uh, global capital markets where there's really large magnitude of numbers. 
uh, any typical transaction, there's, you know, I'm in the middle, so there's, there's, a, there's a buyer and a seller and you have to make both sides work. Um, the, the first thing you have to realize is you have to put yourself in the, in the shoes of the fiduciary. I think the mayor is absolutely a CEO and that's their first job is to be a fiduciary. You need to optimize, first you need to protect the city's assets, which is what I mentioned about where our source of funding is coming from and how that's being impaired. And then optimizing the use of that within the budget and, and getting it to the, the neediest causes. Um, our encampments issue is, Re, to refer to it in, the, in, in economic parlance would be a compounding liability. To the extent that that hasn't been addressed by elected officials over the last three years uh, is a huge problem that we need to confront. Lisa Calderon. I think it's very important that a mayor is well-rounded, and I have four degrees, including a master's law degree and doctorate in education. I've been a nonprofit executive, including running a legal clinic for abused women, as well as shelter programs and administrative programs, hired staff, made payroll, and co-founded with community and system stakeholders the Community Reentry Project for the city for uh, folks coming out of incarceration. Currently, I'm the executive director of Emerge Colorado, where we train Democratic women to run for office and win. Trinidad Rodriguez. I want to talk about my experience in the private sector and in the public and nonprofit sector. My experience in the private sector really was uh, being one of the first people of color and one of the very few people of color to provide investment banking services in the field that I was in and uh, fought for many years to build a business from the ground up, the entire profit and loss statement over 23 years. And I'm proud of our success and the incredible change that we impacted in uh, both in Denver and Colorado and throughout the United States. Secondly, I want to, with respect to my uh, nonprofit and service leadership experience, I have managed and overseen CEOs and executive directors for, you know, nearly eight organizations and these are some of the most efficient and important civic and nonprofit organizations in our community. Now some specific follow-up questions on the issue of experience, leadership, and judgment. As Debbie Ortega mentioned, uh, the trailblazing former Congresswoman Pat Schroeder passed away yesterday. She represented Denver in Congress in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. She was the first woman that Colorado sent to Congress. And one of her best known accomplishments was in 1993 when she passed FMLA unpaid job protection leave. Kelly Bruff, when Colorado Democrats attempted to create paid family leave in 2020, you opposed that as head of the business chamber. Despite your objections, Colorado voters approved it. It's now law and being implemented. As mayor, both through the power of the city of Denver and your bully pulpit, how would you support or oppose the implementation of paid family leave? Yeah, I strongly support paid family leave. I provided it to uh, my own employees at the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. Um, the the city actually agrees with some of the concerns around the state's paid family leave, which employees pay for as well themselves out of their paycheck, and nobody gets 100% of their pay. So the city currently implemented its own paid family leave program so employees don't pay and they get a better benefit. I would 100% support that like I did when I was at the chamber. Thank you. Lisa Calderon, you said as a nonprofit leader and committed progressive, you believe in the power of government to do good with tax dollars. How will you assure taxpayers that you will be careful with their money and spend it wisely? Well, I would certainly support uh, programs that s support the social safety net, including paid family leave, which I think Kelly has revisionist history. She led the opposition against family leave, as she did in terms of gutting worker pay. So part of um, uh, making sure that you are good steward of taxpayer dollars is also taking care of our workers. You don't pass uh, uh, policies to cut their pay, make it longer for them to retire, um, stop automatic pay raises. Um, you know, we have to invest in our workers and that's part of using taxpayer dollars well. Thank you, Lisa Calderon. Uh, Kelly Bruff, you're gonna be able to respond through a related question from Marshall. This is a challenging time to hire and retain city employees. And when you were in city leadership the first time, you advocated for doing away with automatic pay raises, and then you got a pay raise yourself. Why was that fair? And what message does that send city employees from upper management? 
Yeah, uh, city employees still uh, were then and are now eligible for pay raises every single year. The only people uh, for city employees who didn't get a pay raise were people who were not performing their job to satisfaction. That was consistent across the board, and I do think that's a good idea. Uh, we have to hold ourselves accountable. It is about taxpayer money and making sure we're being fair. Uh, I get a chance to respond to Please do. the extra. Uh, so a huge part of fiscal responsibility is the city has a retirement program. It's called the Denver Employees Retirement Program. Uh, it's not fully funded today. When I was there, it was not fully funded either. And part of the challenge that you have to wrestle with as a mayor is either that program isn't there for employees to retire because you spent too much money, or you have to change the program rules to try to ensure it's fully funded. The change in the rules to go from rule of 75 to 85 was a change simply to increase so that it would be financially viable and there for employees. I would argue that's exactly what a mayor should do. Thank you. Leslie Herod, some of your former employees have come forward in recent weeks with concerns about how you treat staff. When a staffer named Kaylee Browning told Denver Wright that working for you was degrading, you said you'd never heard those concerns. Then Nico Delgado, another former staffer who went on to be spokesperson for the Colorado Democratic Party, said that he did come to you with his concerns and that he felt bullied and belittled working for you. Is that how you treat staff? Absolutely not. You know, the interesting thing is that these things are coming up right at, right when ballots are mailing and right during the end of the election. These um, staffers worked for me and worked quite well for me in uh, 2017 when I was first elected. Um, we have been able to accomplish a lot, including passing 150 pieces of legislation into law and stepping in the gap during co the COVID pandemic, sending out daily emails um, to, to my constituents, to Denverites, to talk about how you can get services, how you can get relief. Now. Do I demand a lot? Absolutely. I mean, again, I talked about my mom who was in the service. That's how I was raised, you know? And as a black woman, we've, I've always been told that we have to work five times as hard to get half as far. But honestly, a lot of people on this stage um, and a lot of folks running for mayor have had similar concerns brought up for them, brought up about them and their leadership. A lot of those people are women and people of color. What I will say is that um, when I am brought with challenges, I address them head on. Um, but I know that we are able to do the work because my staff has been so phenomenal and definitely has delivered for, for Denver. Thank you. Debbie Ortega, you said your most significant accomplishment in 28 years on city council was doubling speeding fines in school zones. And around this school, people who come and go from schools, that is vitally important. But it was also during your first stint as a councilwoman. You've been back on council since 2011. So why should voters give you a promotion when you say the most significant thing you've done was decades ago? Good question, thank you for that. Um, I think it is important saving and protecting our children. That The year that we brought that forward and it still applies today was we had five children that were struck by vehicles. A couple of them died. So if you want me to talk about what I've done now, um, I can list off a handful of things. I've been part of bringing forward a livable wage. Um, we have adopted legislation that addresses wage theft. I have been working on a construction careers ordinance that will be brought forward next month with Councilwoman Kanich that will have goals being set on our construction contracts that will have targeted hire as well as apprenticeship hires. So it's an opportunity to create a livable wage for individuals that live in our city that want to work in the construction field. I could go on and on, but those are a couple of examples of things that I've been working on with some of my colleagues. Thank you. Andy Rougeau, you've made a series of false claims in this race. I mean, obviously false stuff, like saying you're the only candidate with business experience, which is not true. Saying you're the only candidate talking about enforcing the urban camping ban, which is not true. Saying that you're the only candidate not taking fair elections fund money, which is not true. And false allegations about some of the other people sitting up here on stage tonight, like your claim that other candidates were illegally paying themselves salaries from fair elections funds, which is not true. What does your willingness to say false things tell voters about your leadership? So I disagree with you, those are false. For example, we have a candidate on the stage, on that end of the stage, who's double dipping. She's paying employees in her position as executive director and through fair election funds. We have candidates on the stage who may say that they are gonna enforce the camping ban. They will not, because they've changed their position multiple times under pressure. Denver deserves a mayor who will actually fight for a future. 
Denver deserves a mayor who has experience as an army officer, as a spil as small business owner, as a father, and who will add 400 police officers. And who's willing to say that? Because when we were at the a similar debate in front of a forum of homeless, I stood up there and said, I will enforce the campaign man to get the homeless to the mental health and drug addiction services they need. I was booed continuously. But my answer doesn't change in front of that forum versus this forum versus another forum. So I am proud that as mayor, I'll bring that experience as a father, as a veteran, as a small business owner to adding those 400 police officers, to enforcing our campaign ban and to making housing more affordable in our city. So taking issue with how another candidate is legally spending funds is very different than accusing someone of illegally violating campaign so, finance law. I, I so think just, I, I want to make sure that we're really clear on this. You said that other folks on this stage were illegally paying themselves salaries. Is anyone here doing that? No, to be clear, people are not paying them salaries. They okay, are, they are acting much. corruptly because we have people okay. not on this stage who are using fair election I funds just wanted, to pay I, at liquor stores. I want to find out if we're using that money true, to pay at cannabis we're going to move on. Invest. I appreciate that. I don't Thank think you very anybody much. in this stage would be happy with politicians Sir, up here on this stage someone else to speak. spending dollars at liquor stores. Okay, it's time for someone else to speak. Chris Hansen. You faced a very public test of leadership earlier in this campaign when black and Latino candidates asked you to reconsider your campaign ad showing seven people of color committing crimes or living on the streets. You described their reactions as, quote, overwrought, and you invoked your multiracial children. The next day, your campaign said their requests were, quote, just politics. What should Denver voters take away from your leadership decisions on that issue? Yeah, very fair question. I mean, I, first, the premise of the question asked at the last debate was incorrect because we had several different races represented in our commercial that was focused on highlighting the most important issues in this entire campaign, which is the focus on public safety and addressing the homelessness crisis. And so the premise of the question was incorrect, and I felt like I needed to make sure that folks were clear about that. That ad, I think, is really clear about how I want to proceed as mayor, the things I want to focus on, and the priorities that I'm sharing with voters. And so it was a directed political attack. I think that was clear. I think the dead voters in Denver know that. And the premise of the question, I believe, was incorrect and corrected that with Kyle Clark on his show uh, several weeks later. So I, I stand by the approach that we're taking because we know we have to address public safety. The number one issue for me as the next mayor is to rebuild our public safety department. All of our grand plans and every other department are not going to work if we don't rebuild public safety. That's exactly what I think we want to focus on. So just real quickly then, for the folks who are saying the representation in that ad did harm, what do you say in response to that? Well, I, I would say that the representation at the start of that ad, of using some news footage from Channel 9, was meant to highlight the two biggest problems in our city right now. And there were multiple races that were represented in those first three, three seconds of the ad. So that's really what uh, I wanted to make sure people know. And then to make sure that the voters know my plans on how to address public safety and how I plan to address the homelessness crisis. Thomas Wolf, I like relatable comparisons, and I've heard you compare the number of city Excuse departments. Excuse me, can you repeat that? I've heard you compare the number of city departments yes. to remote control. I like relatable comparisons. But you've said there's three buttons that you really use on a 50-button remote control, suggesting there are too many city departments. The, the city employs more than 11,000 people. So how many people are you firing and why? It's, <laughs> yeah. Um, th thanks for liking the mission creep. That would be the uh, engineering uh, view of the, of the situation. If you've been on uh, Denver Gov, there's 59 some different departments. Uh, a business would not have uh, 59 different direct reports. Uh, you can easily um, get a, there's plenty of management consultants that could tidy that up quickly. Um, I think the number is more like uh, 12 to 15 in any business in America. Um, I did, that doesn't mean that anybody loses their job. It just means that you govern more effectively as an executive. You have direct reports. You give them out outcomes that they need to deliver to, and you can manage, manage them that way. So you reduce the number of apart de departments, keep the same number of employees. Uh, if they're delivering to the outcomes we need, yes. Thank you. One final specific question about leadership and perhaps judgment. It's about the Denver Broncos. <laughs> The Broncos will not be your responsibility, thankfully, if you were mayor. But Mike Johnson, I did know that you were the only mayoral candidate to tell Nine News on our candidate questionnaire that you support spending taxpayer money for a new Broncos stadium. You want to explain why that's a good idea? 
Yeah, I said that it ha would have to be voter approved, like the last measure, which is I think the voters ought to have a chance to approve it if there is any financial contributions. That doesn't mean it needs to, but I said if there ever was going to be an investment, voters should have to approve it. That's not a decision the mayor should make or the city council should make. If voters want to invest in a new stadium, they should have the chance to make that decision. Would you as mayor weigh in and encourage them to vote for it? Uh, no, I, well, I would, I would weigh in to get the best possible deal we can to not have taxpayers to be on the hook to do it. But I think in the past we've done a mixture of both private and public financing. Uh, I wouldn't tip my hand going into negotiations on what we would or wouldn't do. I'd want to fight to make sure we keep the Broncos in Denver. We hopefully get back to the Super Bowl and we have as little taxpayer obligation as possible. In our nine new survey USA poll of likely Denver voters in collaboration with Denver Gazette and MSU Denver, likely voters in Denver identified homelessness as a top priority. So we're going to hear from everybody on this. But first, let's show the folks at home some of the specific policy positions that you've taken. Then we'll get into details. Most of you here tonight have said that you will enforce Denver's urban camping ban, which is currently done through sweeps of encampments. That's Kelly Bruff, Chris Hansen, Mike Johnston, Debbie Ortega, Trinidad Rodriguez, Andy Rougeau, and Thomas Wolf. Four of you have said you will not enforce Denver's urban camping ban and will not continue the sweeps. Lisa Calderon, Elle Gardner, Leslie Harrod, and Terrence Roberts. And then let's talk about who here said that they will take it a step further and arrest people solely for violating the urban camping ban if they refuse offers of shelter and treatment. That would be Kelly Bruff, Trinidad Rodriguez, Andy Rougeau, and Thomas Wolf. A majority of you have said you will not have people arrested solely for violating the urban camping ban. That would be Lisa Calderon, Al Gardner, Chris Hansen, Leslie Harrod, Mike Johnston, and Terrence Roberts. And Debbie Ortega has refused to say whether she will have people arrested solely for violating the urban camping ban. Debbie Ortega, this is an understandably difficult issue, but every other person up here has come to a conclusion and shared it with voters. Would you like to tell voters tonight whether you will have Denverites arrested solely for violating the urban camping ban? My answer is no, because this is a complex issue. Our homeless population is as diverse as the rest of our community, and there is no one size fits all. I think we need to meet people where they're at, with different options to meet their needs. And we've talked about treatment beds, the need for those, and things like single room occupancy housing for individuals, but I think this is, again, a complex situation that doesn't have just a yes or a no answer to solve how we're gonna get at addressing the needs of the individuals who are challenged to survive in our community. And affordable housing is absolutely a critical part of what we need to bring online to address the needs of so many of these individuals, helping get them back to employment. We have to have an exit plan for individuals that are staying in our facilities because our general fund will not be able to pick up the tab at the end of the day when these federal dollars expire. Thank you. Mike Johnson, you are making a pledge that no one else in this race is making to end homelessness in Denver in your first term. No major American city has ever done this. I want to have a broader conversation about this because Kelly Bruff and Debbie Ortega, you were part of the Hickenlooper administration's efforts to try 20 years ago with Denver's road home. So we'd like to hear from the three of you first on this topic, along with anybody else who feels like they strongly disagree and wants to be heard. Mike Johnson, how will you do what no major American city has done and do it in just four years? Yeah, I think the benefit of this is we've learned a lot from the successes and the failures of the last 20 years. People have been trying hard and been finding real innovations right here in Denver. And so I think we know a couple of things that really work, and these are pressure tested to work. First, as we know, we have to get people access to actual housing. That has to be housing we can build quickly and that provides safety and stability and dignity. That's why uh, what I've proposed are micro communities where you can build tiny homes, 40 or 50 tiny homes. People can have access to safe, stable care. You can then wrap around the services in those communities people need, like mental health support, addiction treatment, workforce training, long-term housing support, and we know people are much more successful in those kind of communities. And third and finally, what we've learned is people, uh, if we want to respect the way community is built among folks who are unhoused, which is an innovation Houston discovered, you want to actually allow people to move by community. And so if you go to one person in an encampment and try to move them on their own, they may not be likely to go. When you open a micro community with 40 or 50 units and you can go to two or three blocks of encampments and say, now folks can move together to a new community that provides more safety and stability, that works. And I would say the data is clear on partnerships where we done this. Uh, a year later, 86% of the people that have moved are still housed. So we know there is a path to make this successful. We just have to do it at scale with the innovations the city has helped develop. Thank you. Kelly Bruff, your boss at the time, Mayor John Hickenlooper, uh, said his 
when he said his goal was to end homelessness, he now says it was just aspirational, not realistic. You said when you worked as his chief of staff, you worked on it as though it was a realistic goal. So is it realistic for Denver to end homelessness now within four years? I don't think so, no. I mean, I think part of this is telling the truth. What we really have to do is build a safety net um, that catches people when things go wrong. And if we build that safety net right, I think we can get people the support and services they desperately need, but I think we have to think about that differently, and frankly, that'd be one of the lessons I took away from that experience. So what does Mike Johnson have completely wrong? Uh, <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think to be able to, oh, is my time up? Did you just hear that? <laughs> um, I think uh, one of the challenges is I don't think it's as simple um, as micro units. Uh, I think we're talking about people who need serious support uh, from a mental health perspective and an addiction perspective. And I think this is where we have to focus our resources as a region to build the kind of facilities we need long term. I think we have people who are chronically homeless who need long term supportive care. And I think that's the other part of what we have to build. I'll give you a quick rebuttal here. Great, yeah, yep. uh, I agree with Kelly. I think one of the things we do need is long-term supportive care, and that's why linked to this plan, what I've said is that I would take two pods of the county jail and convert those, one into long-term inpatient mental health support, which we don't have in the city right now, and one into long-term inpatient addiction-based treatment. So for the folks that have the most profound needs and are still facing repeated criminal charges around those needs, you can get them into a place where they would actually get treatment long-term, get healthy, get stabilized, get transitioned back to the community, and I think that is that is an important part of the puzzle we have to solve. Thank you, Debbie Ortega, I'm coming to you next here. Uh, you've heard both both ends of the spectrum now. We're ending homelessness, and it's not realistic to say we're ending homelessness in four, four years. You were the first head of Denver's Commission on Homelessness 20 years ago, so is the problem easier or harder to solve now? And what do you think about the pledge to end homelessness? So it is harder to solve now just because we have more people, and we, we need to have a lot more options. Like I said, there is no one size fits all. I think the fact that we've been housing people for two years and we have not assisted them with getting back to work. That's a big part of, of being successful. I saw that when we got people back to work under the Denver Road Home Program, and we now have 200 people working in downtown hotels, it changed everything for those individuals. They were successful getting into housing. We housed 1,000 people by working with faith organizations across the Denver Metro community that sponsored a family by offsetting the cost of first month's rent and deposit. These are programs we could bring back, but I think we absolutely need to have the housing options. That's why I think single room occupancy units, the fact that we've been doing the tiny homes or the safe sanctioned uh, safe outdoor spaces have been part of that solution. But we have to have different spectrums of housing price points that don't exist in our market today. Thank you, Dean. Trinidad Rodriguez, you said that you would forcibly institutionalize most of Denver's homeless population, as many as a thousand people, and hold them against their will for months of treatment in what you're calling a field hospital. Civil rights attorney Joe Salazar called that an internment camp, said it's illegal. RTD's director called you a fascist. Why do you believe your plan is legal and moral? Because under Title 27 of the state's uh, Colorado revised statutes, there is the power for governments uh, and certain organizations to actually intervene when people are of danger to themselves and others, and when they're clinically diagnosed with substance and uh, mental health disorders. This exists in state law today. This is not a pie-in-the-sky fantasy, and I respectfully disagree with those two individuals you mentioned. These are, this is not an internment camp. This is a place where we can provide the standard of care for healing for people who are suffering and dying on our streets today. And it is the right thing to do. It's the only right thing to do. The power and strength and potency of um, our current formulas for methamphetamine that are flooding our streets and the, the absolutely vicious nature of fentanyl and the analog drugs is causing people to experience extraordinary risk. When I went on Kyle on Friday, shortly thereafter, I got an email from a mother she said she was a desperate mother. She told me about her daughter who's 32 years old, who's been living on the streets for eight years, being constantly abused and raped while she's pumped with drugs. That is what I'm looking to fight. I'm looking to save lives. So.
If, if people are already saying that it's illegal, which is hinting at the potential for legal lawsuits, why not take that money and spend it on housing and allocate it for housing, which homeless advocates have said is what will be needed to help get the city out of this crisis? They're, they're wrong. It's not illegal. It, it's just not illegal. There's Title 27 of the Colorado Revised Statutes provides for an ability to put place people are under a 72 hour hold and then with the sign off of a clinician with the opinion of a clinician a diagnosis of mental health or substance use disorder that meets the standard of uh, a short term certification for short term treatment that provides a three month window to provide the standard of care treatment for people who are uh, of grave uh, danger and risk to them, themselves and others. Lisa Calderon, I, I saw you shaking your head in disagreement. You want to take 30 seconds to explain why? This is why people with a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous. Um, there's a reason why we have a separation of branches. The judiciary, the executive, and the legislative. Uh, judges determine involuntary commitment, not the executive branch. There is a process for taking away people's constitutional rights and human rights. So there's that. Um, regarding um, uh, uh, Mike, it's just naive. I mean, focusing on these temporary solutions, my plan has been co-created with unhoused people. And so it's interesting hearing people who have no experience working with unhoused people about what's best for them. Thank you. Trinidad Rodriguez, if you'd like to respond. So in my experience of 25 years working to tackle homelessness and the vagaries, the severe dangers of people living and dying on our streets, there is Title 27 of the Colorado Revised Statutes. Do you agree that's the case? Trinidad, how you're applying it, you're, you're, you're using yourself in place of a I'm judge. not using myself. I'm, it, so there's laws. There are many laws to do a lot of things with people, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't oppose them. Like, a mayor is not an emperor. So you have to go through I, a legal I, process. I never said I and was. And they have a point. right to an attorney before being institutionalized. You're skipping over all I'm of not, that process. I'm not. I'm not. Because I, you think I you know what's best. No, I'm acknowledging that there are guardrails around how people's rights get protected while we try and protect them from dying. While we try and protect them from the most severe and brutal experiences on our streets, rounding and it's a fantasy, up, and it's a fantasy to talk about up drugs not being a severe part of the problem. So I'm asking you, why wouldn't rights. you help somebody through a severe crisis? Like Thank you both. Why wouldn't you do that? I have done Thank that work. Both. Well, then, so, why, and then that's why not how the work gets done. Ed Rodriguez, just a moment. Th Thomas Wolf, please. please. I please. Yeah, so have I. Thomas Wolf, when you've answered questions about homelessness and even in your, in your introduction today, you've talked about property values, the cleanliness of the city, safety. You even mentioned this today empathy for teachers. What about the people experiencing homelessness? Do you care about them or just getting them out of the way? You wouldn't be in this race if you didn't. I mean, call me the big bad wolf because I want to confront this problem. I'll wear it, but I can prove to you why it's good for the people individually and it's good for the city. The point over here is we've seen this person that has their head in a trash can. Um, they haven't bathed in however long. They don't know what their name is. They don't know what date it is. Then they walk right out into Broadway regardless of you know what's going on. I think the medical term is capacity. That person is not when they're confronted now, it obviously needs to be, be a triage between clinicians, social workers, and backup from police office, for sure. So what happens is they're likely gonna be delivered to Denver Health, okay? And then there's a medical, uh, medical approach to whether they've, they've lost capacity to care for themselves. And then um, the problem is there isn't enough capacity at Denver Health, so Denver Health doesn't know what to do with them. Your city needs to step in. I've suggested that we use uh, surplus of facilities that the city currently has, so we can immediately do this. Um, to, to not do it is the most inhumane thing. But with respect, I asked you about, you just gave me process, and I asked you if you, if you care about these people, but you gave me the process. So do you care about the people, or do you just want to get them out of the way? I'm gonna solve, well, if, I, if I'm taking, them, if they were out in a 20 below zero and I'm offer, I'm, I have a path to get them to shelter, does that not show I care for them? They're, care they're for them. currently still out. I, care I mean, for them. there's 2,000 people in encampments in Denver this evening, okay? Would it be more humane to get them into Denver property or not? 
I'm proposing that, that we do that, and we do it yesterday. We've been three years in this crisis and it's compounding against us. Thank you. Andy Rougeau, I'm hoping that voters can learn a bit more tonight about your philosophy about how we assist folks experiencing homelessness beyond your talking points of enforce the camping ban, hire 400 police officers, fight for Denver's future. Mm -hmm. What is your plan to assist folks who are unhoused into finding stability and eventually self-sufficiency? Yes. So it's looking at what is the underlying cause for someone who is unsheltered in our streets. And I have a beautiful park right by my house. And I have gone out there with my now three-year-old in my arms walked out the back gate and seen a man with his pants around his ankles using his restroom, defecating along the fence line. Now, that man is someone's son. That man might be somebody's father. And that man is dealing with a fentanyl addiction issue or other drug addiction issue. So the actual compassionate thing to do for that person is to get them clean. The compassionate thing to do for that person is to reconnect them to family. The compassionate thing to do that person is allow them to get back to the point where they can hold a job, where they can reconnect with family, where they have a chance to build a future again. So that's why enforce the camping ban is that critical first step for getting people into the mental health and drug addiction services the city already provides. Because we spend, <laughs> based off the Common, Common Sense Institute, between thirty and $70,000 per homeless person right now. So again, sir, the question was, what are you going to do beyond enforce the camping ban? And you just explained your philosophy of why you will enforce the camping ban and said nothing about how you help people transition into stability and then self-sufficiency. Yes, what are your plans for that? Because I'm saying the underlying cause is a drug addiction or a mental health issue. So do you the most have plans? Yes. So the, what are they? I'm clearly speaking them to you right now, Kyle. So the most important issue is getting people off the streets into those services in the first place. Because right now there is capacity. Go to Step Denver, a great organization downtown. They will tell you they have beds available. That's an organization where you can walk off the street, they will get you clean, and they'll get you a job. They'll reconnect you to your family. So the issue is not a lack of services by the city. It's not a lack of dollars. It's a lack of political will to enforce our camping ban, to follow the method that's proven successful, because we have seen it successful. We've seen it successful in cities like Colorado Springs, where aggressive enforcement of a sit-lie ordinance combined with an excellent Colorado Springs rescue mission with wraparound services, which Denver already has. We have great NGOs here who are working hard. So the key thing missing right now is enforcing the camping ban to fight for Denver's future. Thank Correction, you. Correction, step 13, they're great. <laughs> Al Gardner. They only serve men. Al Gardner, you had a refreshing, I don't know answer in your one-on-one -on -one with Kyle uh, about how to address homelessness. Now, honestly, I, I've said I don't know to questions he's asked. It's, it's a fair answer. However, everyone else here on stage has not said, I don't know. Yeah. Why does that not disqualify you when everyone else here has some sort of concrete plan? Yeah, because I'm not afraid to be honest and at worst, at best, saying that we can do things in a short amount of time is ambitious, at worst, it's pandering. So we know that there are a lot of systems, there are a lot of things in place in Denver, a lot of organizations. I've sat down with Homeless Leadership Coalition with a lot of folks that have a lot of great services, and we have to try to figure out how that looks. So my I don't know is more akin to what is the best idea, because I don't believe we've arrived at that yet. When I listen down the line, uh, Trinidad's idea, we talk about internment, essentially. The country's tried that before, and it did work out well. Try to answer the question around what Wolf has just said over there. I can answer that question very easily. I care. If I go to further down the line and I look at what Andy has just said regarding of where he would put people and he doesn't know the guy using the restroom behind his house. When I look at that individual, I don't look at someone trying to offend me. I look at that as somebody who's losing their dignity because they're unhoused. I look at that as someone who's exposing himself to my three-year-old daughter and is not helpful to that man. That man is not being helped by using a public rest instead of using a public restroom that's immediately across the street from my house using the yard. The compassionate thing for that person, again, who is, pro who is a son for sure, could be a father to get that person clean and help not to allow him to do that. I, I Thank you, Andy Rougeau. Uh, yes, your plan was referred to as an internment camp yeah. again, so you're welcome to respond. A, that's not my plan. B, <laughs> B I, I take severe offense to the idea that uh, people who are experiencing actual health crises and um, are of danger to themselves or others are like Japanese people. And so your uh, facility with sort of taking these concepts and throwing them around without even knowing why you got into this race, uh, Al, is just completely uh, inappropriate. Yeah. 
taking someone without, the, the, without their will. It's in them, the state law. Telling them what's best for them is paternalistic at best and is mean-spirited at worst. So I, I demand an apology yep. to people, the Japanese Americans. You can demand Americans what you would like, but what interned. I understand okay. is that sure, doing it. that to someone un, involuntarily is not what we're about in this country, and it's not what we're about in this city. You just admitted you know nothing about homelessness. Thank so you both. Thanks for your opinion. Question for Terrence Roberts. You said that people experiencing homelessness don't want to live in tough sheds. <clears throat> Whose plan are you talking about with the tough sheds? And then how would you obtain a better type of transitional shelter that we can scale to the level that we need? I'm definitely talking about Mike's plan. <laughs> <laughs> Do those things even have plumbing? <laughs> Do they have AC? I don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough shed, okay? <laughs> What homeless people are saying is they do not want to live in shelters, but shout out to our shelters that are doing the work. They're not failing, they're overwhelmed. What homeless people are saying is they want house keys. They don't want to live in a shed with 50 other people in other sheds without plumbing, without AC, without heat. If we create a public banking system like other municipalities, we can add that money to our, um, to our public safety dollars or, or to our general fund to make sure that we can buy or retrofit more public housing. Uh, also, we can, we can um, have safe encampments that, that do have warm showers, that have menstrual products, hygiene products, uh, that keep people safe with safe lighting. We need to make Denver a 24-hour city. There are better plans than putting people in tough sheds or just continuing to build affordable housing that is not being um, lived in because people cannot afford our affordable housing. It, at the risk of getting us sued by the people who own Tough Shed. Would you, would you like to explain in 30 seconds whether or not you Shout intend out the to tough put shed unsheltered people in Tough Sheds? They are not. Uh, they are not Tough Sheds. Um, they are, in fact, tiny homes that have heating, that have access to showers, that have access to kitchens, that have all the wraparound services people need, and they are a transitional plan. That's right. But they are far better than what we know is happening now, which is leaving folks to sleep in tents where you have people that are freezing to death, which is what happened two weeks ago in downtown Denver. Thank you. But better, Hansen. For, but better for who? So when you talk to unhoused people and you have to share bathrooms and you have to share kitchens they don't have their they don't have homes I agree with Terrence they want house keys and so your continued emphasis on temporary solutions as everybody wants to go there that's why I co-created my plan with unhoused people who say they don't want that long term they don't want that short term they want actual homes which your plan doesn't address it's it's thousands short of the kinds of homes that we need it does it does address it so two things one is what we know is we can't build everyone a single family home because that takes three years and five hundred thousand dollars people don't have three years to wait and that's so what we're going to do master leasing what we do want is to be able to begin to build the capacity for long-term housing that's why my affordable housing plan has called for building 25,000 permanent units where people could move into that housing what we know is right now people need access to safe stable uh, protected housing and that does mean not living in a tent not living in an encampment and you need to be, do something we can build quickly they don't want curfews they don't want to be regulated. I they want to be that. able to go and come just like you. you do. That's correct. And have a nice place to sleep at night just like you do without somebody lording over them about what they can and can't do and who can and can't visit them. No Thank version you. We of want that. to bring no. in a couple of other people who haven't been heard on this topic yet. Chris Hansen, your approach to housing includes addressing the missing middle. You talk about dedicating more of the budget towards shoring up housing security for families at risk of losing their houses. How much of the budget should be dedicated to helping those living on the streets versus those on the verge of losing their home? And does that require moving around the money that the city is already spending or new funds? Yeah, I, I think it likely means moving around the city money that's already being spent. So my uh, advertisement I recently put out emphasizes that we're spending $250 million this year on homelessness services. Much of that money is being short, spent on some short-term solutions that are not showing long-term payoff. So I've called for an immediate audit of the full slate of spending that we're doing because we need to focus on the models that we're seeing success. And this is one of the things I pioneered at the state level using evidence-based budgeting at the Joint Budget Committee. And we made some sizable investments in last year's state budget. I led on those because Denver needed help, like the Ridgeview facility east of town, where you have stable housing, 
with the wraparound services people need on the mental health and addiction side. The same thing ran a bill last year to help the nonprofits accelerate expansion of their capacity so that nonprofits can build for for men, for women, and for families. We're short of that right now. The state is helping to make those investments to shore up those weaknesses. Those are the models that work. I've studied what happened in San Antonio and in other places around the country. It's stable housing with wraparound services. That's a long-term result. Thank you. Leslie Herod, your plan to address homelessness focuses on making people an offer of shelter that you think is gonna be so good they won't refuse it, that they'll <laughs> take you up on the deal. Because you're saying that you will not back that up with encampment sweeps or arrests. How do you accomplish the scale of shelter and housing that Denver so far has not been able to accomplish with so much money spent? I'm glad you asked that question. And I just want to first um, acknowledge the, the tension, but also the lack of hope on this stage right now. Um, we shouldn't let any of us knock the hope out of us or out of Denver. We can make sure that Denverites are safe, housed, and secure. In fact, if you go to my website right now, leslieformayor.com, you will not only see my plan for housing, you will see vacant blighted lots in Denver today and what we can transform them into when it comes to housing in not three years, but in fact, in four to six months. But additionally, we can get people long-term housing. I mean, if we think, and, and short-term housing, and I think it has to be a combination. But if we think about what we're hearing today, we are missing the fact that we have to be compassionate about the people. Putting people in jail costs between $200 and $500 or $600 a day. As someone who's worked with the state budget, I know these numbers. I know that in fact, instead, we can get people housed. 80 to 90% of people living on the streets in Denver today want to be housed, they want wraparound services, and we can provide that with city dollars and with the federal infrastructure dollars that are coming in today. We have hundreds of units proposed, thousands of units proposed right now on my website in over 60 lots that are vacant and owned by the city and county of Denver. We can do this now. Thank you. We're about halfway through our allotted two hours. Want to provide you an opportunity now to ask questions of one another. Uh, feel free to include some context, but please do get to a question, and then please do let the other person respond. And we ask that folks limit their responses to roughly 30 seconds. Trinidad Rodriguez, a question you have for anyone else up here. Yeah, I'd like to ask Mike Johnston. Um, you know, your plan calls for these tiny home villages. We had, you know, certainly some experience with this when we d had uh, low-income housing projects. And um, you're, how many are you proposing to site in Denver, and where are you going to put them to address the 1,500 people that you claim the, these uh, facilities will serve? Yeah. How many and where? Yeah. Specifically. Yeah. So there, I think there are 1,400 units is the target that we would want to build. Uh, I, I've said that's probably 10 to 20 micro communities. Those those include two options. Some of those could be tiny home villages. Some of them can be hotel conversions. Hotel conversions are larger uh, and can do higher volume, but you want to do some combination of the two. And I think this is where we have the false choice. The false choice is either we have to leave people in encampments and can do nothing, or we have to wait to be able to build everyone single family homes. And that can't get to the scale of 1,400 units. And so- no, And that wasn't the question. You didn't no, answer the question. No, I'm, I'm, is, yeah, okay. I'm answering the question. So your question is where would those be cited? Yeah. Um, so the option is we would, you know, we have, as Leslie was referring, there are vacant lots all around the city that the city and county of Denver owns. We would find places that are close to public transit that are not in dense residential neighborhoods, but they're in places that are a combination of commercial and transit connected. And the benefit of bringing services to these communities is it doesn't mean that they have to have direct access to downtown all the time. So this included services means there's more flexibility on where they could be cited. So I'd thank, like the thank record you, thank to you, reflect he did not answer the question. Lisa Calderon, your question for someone I, I did else. answer it. No, you didn't. Uh, Y'all are done. Where are they going to go? Turn now. <laughs> you guys, are, you guys are go, done. Mike? Lisa Calderon, where are you going to put them? Do you want me to answer that or not? No, y'all are done. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Lisa Calderon. Please. Uh, yes, I have a question for Kelly Bruff. Um, so you and I and a few of us others um, turned in our tax returns, um, and your reported income when you were at the chamber was about a half a million dollars a year. Um, uh, you are also a top... Uh, uh, person who's, who's getting campaign donations from the real estate, corporations, developers. How can Denver voters actually believe that you can relate to their everyday struggles when you are so closely in bed with the same people who got us into this unaffordable housing mess? Yeah, um, I am lucky. Uh, the kind of money I got to make at the chamber, I'll acknowledge that. Uh, but let's start with, uh, you can't, uh, I'm part of the Fair Elections Fund. You cannot accept money from corporations, developers. Um, and I will be the top fundraiser for Denver residents giving in the Fair Elections Fund. 
So I actually think I have much more of a grassroots commitment to my campaign um, than probably anybody on this stage expected, and I'm extremely proud of it. But I would also say the reality is the next mayor needs to bring together our community in ways we never have, frankly. And I think this is where the employees of whether they work in the private sector or employees work in the nonprofit sector or employees who work in the public sector who've given to my campaign, I think what they could expect from me as mayor is the same kind of coming together to address the issues, finding solutions that make sense from multiple perspectives and diverse backgrounds. Thank you. And that's exactly how I'd work. Thank so you. You, de you denounced a nearly Just $2 million one, one, in one dark money apiece. that's going towards your campaign. One question apiece. Thomas Wolf, you have the next question. Yeah, first I'd like to apologize that I haven't begged for money every 13 seconds from Denver. I set a budget to uh, go pretty much technology-wise, see if my message would resonate, and I'm answering to voters. There is a question in here. Yep. Um, the one side of it is in the dark money that you can see that there's coastal billionaires that are funding a lot of the independent expenditures um, for, I guess I go to Mike, uh, why should those people have sway or, you know, why, why are they in this election? Uh, yeah, I, I think I don't have people funding that entity that have interest before the city. You know, so I'm not looking at people that have uh, complicit or, or vested interest there. I think uh, I obviously have nothing to do with that entity, so I don't raise for it. I don't know who gives to it. But I think what I've seen is those are people who have a vision for they want to see politics that works. They want to see a city that's going to be able to deliver results on hard problems. Can Denver be a city that builds a proof point for the country on what we can do on homelessness, on what we can do on affordable housing, on what we can do on public safety? And so um, I, I've been working hard to build resources for my own campaign directly that have come from people all across the city and we're proud of that support just just to clarify you said you don't know who gives to it like that's yeah, only when it's publicly it would be reported okay so you no. do know who gives because we all know who gave yeah, only when it's publicly reported I mean, okay Sam Reed Hoffman Mike Bloomberg yeah you know, the names are publicly reported okay I just want to I just want to clarify that Chris Hansen question for somebody else yeah I, I'm gonna stay on this topic actually because <laughs> I think this is super important so again for Mike you've run for office three times in the last five years each time you've run, you've had California and New York billionaires, some of them have just been named, support your campaign each time. Uh, they've given six and seven figure donations into your IEs. So can you please share with the Denver voters what these donors are gonna expect if you win this race? Yeah, I think that's nothing because they've not had any conversation with me on what they do expect. I think it's actually very different when you have folks that are civic leaders who care about building solutions to hard problems. They're not developers or they're not uh, local market people who have businesses before the city and county of Denver. So I think there is no expectation. I've not made any commitment. There's no one that's, that's obligated to me. There are people that back leaders who they think have the capacity to be transformational on hard problems. And so uh, for me, I think people have faith in what Denver can do and how you can get us from a city that has struggled, like many other cities that have struggled, like the San Francisco's or the Portland's or Seattle's who have not been able to turn the tide on things like homelessness and affordable housing uh, and public safety. I think people are looking for leaders in a time when politics is broken to see if they can build those results. Thank you. Terrence Roberts, do you have a question for Mike Johnson? <laughs> or, <laughs> or anyone? Well, now that you mention it, <laughs> I actually do have a question for, we just gonna pound Mike, y'all. Well, he looks so poundable right now. <laughs> Um, but I know I do have a serious question because me and Mike, we do go really far back and we did open our office in the Holly. Mm -hmm. There were 88 homicides last year. Mm -hmm. There were 96 homicides the year before that. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, there were 95 homicides. Mm -hmm. After I was attacked by active blood gang members in the Holly, there's a whole documentary. You're in it. Marshall's in it. Kyle's in it. Yeah. Leslie's in it for a hot second. You said you didn't need to watch the documentary because you lived it, but me and you, before I had to defend myself, we had an argument because you were not there. A young lady on the documentary even says, where is our congressman, where is our senator? She was talking about you. You let those bloods move into our office. I think they're still in there. Gang violence has exponentially risen since that day, I had to defend myself. It's at an all-time high right now. Do you think you played a part now by letting active Crenshaw Mafia bloods move into our office who were wearing red bandanas, organizing in the holly, doing those things after they publicly attacked me, then slandered me to the Denver Post? They even surrounded me on 9 News. Terrence Roberts, please let him answer. Oh, um, sorry, I'm sorry. It's all good. 
Yeah, for those that don't know the context, Terrence and I shared an office together for about six years in the Holly. Um, I'm proud of the work that we did there. I mean, you mentioned today the construction that happened in the Holly, the building of the rec center, the what is now the African American Health Center. Uh, I think you did good work to help mitigate the impact of gangs in that neighborhood. Uh, you had a bigger part in that than I did. Uh, I was trying to be representative of the people in my district who could walk off the street and into our office and say, hey, I can't get a job. What's wrong with workforce training? Uh, I thought it was important to have a community presence in that neighborhood, and that's what I tried to do. Uh, and so I do think we have still an increasing public safety challenge in the city, and there's more work to be done. That's why I've come out to say I think we do have to do more in the way of early prevention, in the way of early intervention. A lot of the things that you were doing with young people to keep them from getting into negative peer groups, that's why I was proud to have you there. Um, and so I think there's work to be done, uh, but I feel like that's the kind of work we did together 10 years ago. I'd want to do it again together for the next 10 years, whatever role the two of us are in. Do you thank, like, thank you. Can I, no, we're just going to do one question, we're going to move on. Right. Mike Johnson, do you have a question for yourself? I, I'd love to uh, ask myself <laughs> a question. What what makes you so great? Why are you such a great candidate for mayor? Um, uh, no, actually, I have a question for Terrence, which is I do think you have real expertise and, uh, uh, and wisdom on this issue. You've lived through past waves of violence in the city, and you have a unique perspective on it. I'd be curious what your thought is on what the current moment means and what our best chance is to get out of the kind of youth violence we're seeing at really high levels in the city right now. I mean, so you know my platform is, um, I think, all violence is connected to poverty. Some violence is connected to patriarchy, mainly domestic violence, these different things, but most youth violence is connected to poverty, which people are not, like we said on Kai Show, are not talking about. And where are, where's most of people's dollars going, especially in Northeast Denver, the Five Points, Montbello, Green Valley Ranch, it's going to their food costs, their housing costs, fuel costs, getting their kids back and forth to school. We need to make sure that we have more housing democracy in the city. We need to make sure we have more food democracy for food deserts in this city and ways to get people food when there's blizzards and when it's cold outside. We need to make sure youth have more youth activities. We need to make sure that there's more after school programs, positive youth spaces. And you know I lowered, not just me, I said earlier my team, we lowered youth violence in Denver for six years straight. We lowered homicides for youth gang violence and domestic violence, but attacking poverty with our public safety dollars, that's what's going to lower the bulk of our violence is youth and gun related in Denver, and we can do better, and that's my plan. Thank you very much. Al Gardner. Guess who this question is for? <laughs> I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> this is for Debbie, uh, and I could really ask a number of people on this stage. Um, in support of Proposition 20, um, City Park golf course, and we talk about that a lot. I think it's a consensus around that we need around 50,000 units in the city to be able to support uh, uh, low to middle income housing. And through reading that uh, agreement, uh, the neighborhood agreement uh, portion, we're looking at roughly around 3,000 3, units, but 10% is set aside, which is around 300 units for low mixed income units. If we're trying to solve something to get 50,000 people that actually need that housing, we're looking at 10% of what the full capacity of that is. Looking at 300, is that enough? And why not go back to the drawing board to come with something more stringent to make sure we're getting the best bang for our buck and more folks housed? Thank you for that question. First of all, it's 25%. That is what the community benefit agreement calls for on the Park Hill Golf the Course. The UGI is 300, and actually it splits up to 100 for um, three different sections, and it comes up to 300. Well, that's not what they shared with us when they brought that to City Council for approval to move it to the vote of the people. Mm -hmm. It was 25 percent, and that is what we've been told would be recorded if it passes the vote of the people as a covenant on the property. So if Westside decided to sell the land, whoever that next buyer is would have to adhere to those same obligations. Mm -hmm. So this is a private developer, private property, not city-owned. Um, and we have been able to get more affordable housing in this project than we have even under land owned by the city where we have mandated affordability. So that's part of why I voted to move it to a vote of the people. The voters get to decide whether or not this passes. If it does, then that would be recorded. If it doesn't, it reverts back to a golf course and there's no guarantee that it will be operated as a golf course. So. 155 acres, 100 acres will be open space, 25% affordable housing, a commitment to a grocery store in a food desert that would serve needs for these communities. That's all part of why I think it was important to move that project forward. 
Debbie Ortega, thank you. Kelly Bruff, your question for someone else. Uh, I could ask anyone this, but I'll ask Al. Okay. Uh, Al, if you were elected mayor, uh, what keeps you up at night right now when you think about on day one what your greatest concern would be? Mm. Where would I make the most impact mm. and how to discern where to make the impact? Because there's so many balls to juggle. And that's a difficult piece for all of us up here. And I think we're all passionate about that. Mm -hmm. But that would keep me up at night if I'm focusing on the right thing. And if I am, if I'm giving it the right kind of time and energy and money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Andy Rougeau, your question for someone. Question for you, Leslie. So you previously said in the summer of 2020 that you support divestment 100% that you saw your police accountability, accountability bill as the first step towards defunding the police. Will you take accountability, according to the 5280 article, will you take accountability for rising crime in our city and a lack of police officers? Thank you for the question. Um, I did not speak about divestment of the police. In fact, I talked about um, how we created STAR in the summer of 2020. STAR is a support team assisted response uh, that law enforcement, activists, abolitionists all came together and said, we need help. We need an alternative to 911 where we have a mental health professional and an EMT respond to calls. I worked with Chief Pazin on that, on that measure and so many community activists and organizers. We saw it work in cahoots out of Eugene, Oregon. Uh, Caring for Denver funded that measure and then we had <laughs> we had the foresight to launch it in the summer of 2020. Uh, we didn't, right in downtown. We did not expect what was going on with the summer of reckoning, but we did take that tough time and provided services. During that time on STAR, we had zero negative instances on STAR, period. Now, when it comes to working on police accountability, I'm proud of the work that we did. I'm proud of the work that we did here in Denver. Denverites took to the streets and said, we demand accountability after the murder of George Floyd, after the murder of Elijah McClain. My dad's a law enforcement officer. He worked his way up from a groundskeeper to the head of internal investigations. He's the best man I know. He asked for accountability for his fellow officers as well. The police accountability law was the sweeping bill that, that went, ran across the nation. It's the most comprehensive bill to ensure that we're holding police accountable. But we've got so much more work to do. And I want to give hats off to the people on this stage that worked alongside of us to make that happen. That includes Terrence Roberts. That includes Lisa Calderon. And I want to say thank you all for standing in that gap. Some on the streets, most on the streets, <laughs> um, and, and had our back as we fought for real change. It's not the only thing that we need to see happen here when it comes to accountability, but it was an important step, and I'm proud of that work, and I'm proud of Denver. Thank you. Oh, Leslie I... Harrod, your question for Thank someone you. else up here. Sure. Um, and so my question is uh, for Mike. <laughs> um, but actually, it's just because I heard something just now that I hadn't heard before, um, and that was really around uh, changing the jails to ensure that there's more mental health pods uh, for those who are on the streets. And we already have mental health pods in our jails right now. In fact, Denver Jail is leading on a lot of issues when it comes to medically assisted treatment, having mental health pods, having substance misuse and detox, and quite frankly, not sure that that's the most therapeutic environment to get people um, where they need to go. And so for me, my question is, is this only for the unhoused? who are suffering for substance misuse, and how is that not jailing people? If it's, in fact, in Denver jails, are they going to be able to come and go as they please? Uh, thanks for the great question. Um, I know this is for people who are facing criminal charges, so people who are facing criminal charges. And when you talk to the sheriffs, I know as you have and I have, what we hear is there's an overrepresentation right now of people who are sitting in our jails for whom their major issues are addiction or mental health services. And they're there and not getting the services they need to actually get healthy. So there are starts, there are exciting things beginning at those jails. I think what we need are more actual mental health professionals, more actual addiction treatment support that would make those the kind of support people need. So the idea is this is only for a subset of people who are facing criminal charges charges, but those criminal charges are linked to their addiction or mental health needs, well, and they could be exists. placed. That already exists right now in Denver, and in fact, Caring for Denver funds some of those positions, but so does Denver Health, and so many, so does the city, and so that already Allow exists, him to respond. and so I guess I'm wondering what the difference is. Yeah, the, there, there are some successful early pilots. There's not enough capacity there to meet the no amount of need there is in those places, and so there are individual people that are trying to get treatment. What they'll say in the jail is there's far more demand than they have the capacity right now to treat around this mental health and addiction need, so uh, my hope is really to expand that capacity and to provide more of the mental health professionals that do the work that you want them to do. Thank, Thank you. you both. Debbie Ortega, last question for someone else up here. So the issues we've been talking about tonight, no doubt have dominated this mayor's race 
and have impacted the city. But I want to change the subject and I want to ask Al a question. Um, so as you know, part of the role of the mayor is also addressing contracts. So what would you do in ensuring fairness in the contracting process? Yeah, the first thing, is two, two things, and the first thing would be quite easy, and that's ensuring equitable distribution of those contracts, and that's on a couple of levels, adhering to what we're supposed to follow from a city perspective, and then adhering to what we're supposed to follow from a federal perspective, and then taking a look at the women and minor minority business uh, guide rails that are around how we choose and ensuring that that is in place and not choosing it based on association, who we know are campaign funds. The second thing was be making sure that we don't enter into unilateral contracts where the city loses and the contractor or developer wins. My history and my ability to go through contracts I've spent the past 20 plus years taking a look at contracts, making sure that the corporations that I represent in IT contracts win and that we don't enter in contracts where we lose and we look at the full cost benefit analysis and total cost of ownership before we get into them. So two things, making sure it's equitable. The second thing, making sure that the city of Denver wins and that we choose the right contractor. All right, thank you both very much. Most of you on the stage tonight oppose the idea of Denver creating a supervised use site where people could use illegal drugs under medical supervision with the goal of preventing overdose deaths. The state legislature is currently considering giving Denver and other municipalities the go ahead they would need to do that. I'm going to show folks at home where you stand on this issue. The candidates opposed to the idea of a supervised use site are Kelly Bruff, Al Gardner, Chris Hansen, Mike Johnston, Trinidad Rodriguez, Andy Rougeau, and Thomas Wolf. The candidates who have indicated they support the creation of a supervised use site are Lisa Calderon, Leslie Herod, Debbie Ortega, and Terrence Roberts. Debbie Ortega, 30 seconds for this, please. This issue has you in rare alignment with the more progressives, uh, the candidates here on, this, on stage. Why do you think is a supervised use site a good idea? So I misanswered this question the last time that you asked it. So we do not have a safe injection site in the city today, but we do have a harm reduction facility. And the legislation that city council passed was to allow one. And that's what I would support, is one in the city of Denver. But why do you think it's a good idea? Why? Because I have seen the work that the harm reduction facility has done in helping move people away from a life of addiction. They have gotten them connected to services and other resources that have helped them move away from a life of addiction. Mike Johnson, in 30 seconds, why are you opposed to the idea? Uh, I don't see it as the best first step for us to try to make the city safer, to make people get access to more treatment to get them healthy. I think these biker communities, we have people that have a sense of safety, stability, support. You get the bottom level of Maslow's Triangle in place. And then you have people that are right next to you every day who provide that kind of counseling and support and give you chances to choose to get healthy. I think that's more likely to be successful in the early stages than us giving people access to that on stage one. Can I just raise a, a sort of a counter to this? Well, you explained why you favor it. He explained why he's opposed. You've both stated your positions. We're going to hear from somebody else. So during the 2018-2019 debate over supervised use sites, opponents suggested that these sites might end up in residential neighborhoods, which was never proposed. So I'd like to hear from you about who you support, who supports supervised use sites on where you think they should be located. We're asking for a brief answer, 30 seconds. We'll start with Lisa Calderon. Yeah, and my response initially is to Mike, who again has not done this work and doesn't understand how addiction works. People have to be alive to help them. And harm reduction has been a proven strategy to help keep people alive. When I ran the city's reentry program, that was about harm reduction. It isn't about telling people that they need to get clean right away. It's about stabilizing people. It's about understanding their triggers and using motivational interviewing about, you know, what is the resistance that you are having? So there is a whole process that goes through in harm reduction and you have to get people in the door for that to work. But where, where would you look at for locations? I would say where there's a need. And so we know downtown Denver there's a need. We know in Capitol Hill there's a need. But I would also say because of the urban camping ban, um, homelessness has been pushed into neighborhoods. And so where people are congregating, you can, you can do um, services on the street. So where people are naturally congregating for services is where we need them. Leslie Herr? Absolutely. Uh, you know, 
I come to this work uh, most, most based on family experience. So my sister has served 30 years in and out of jail, in and out of prison, around substance misuse. And I quite frankly, and my family is quite frankly, was really um, happy and relieved every time she came home. Um, I'm proud to say that she's clean and sober today. She has extended her lease now multiple times and she's in school for political science. But in order to get someone there to recovery, we've got to save their lives. These are people who are people's children, cousins, sisters, aunts, and uncles, and they deserve to have someone who cares enough about them to say, come in, come in, and I will provide that help. So I've actually am probably one of the few on stage that has been to an overdose prevention site. I have seen them work. I've seen them provide the services that people need on location to get them into sobriety. I've also seen mobile units, as Ms. Cald uh, Dr. Excuse me, Lisa Calderon has mentioned, um, mobile units that they can actually go where people need them. And I think these are solutions for Denver. Again, where would they go? So I think I spoke about the mobile units that will go to where the need is. Um, right now, the, the idea when, when City Council passed that bill was that the Harm Reduction Action Center, who has stepped up and said time and time again and lobbied for this bill, that they want to make sure that their site is a supervised uh, use site, an overdose prevention site. They are saving lives every day, and they know they can do more with this tool. The purpose is to bring people home and keep people healthy, housed, and secure. Terrence Roberts? Um, they will go where, like Dr. Calderon said, they will go where the need is, uh, especially downtown along the Triangle area where they're finding people dead from fentanyl overdose usage. Um, we're having hundreds of people die in our state over uh, a family member of mine passed away from a fentanyl overdose. And so uh, downtown along Smith Road, uh, we can't expect people who are chronically homeless and they have an addiction for whatever reason, sexual abuse, whatever, who, who knows why, to travel to far north these Denver on the bus to, or wherever to get services. If someone may end up dead from fentanyl, we need to meet them where they're at. So they're gonna probably be where we have the largest concentration of homelessness in other areas, like Dr. Calderon is saying, where people are being pushed due to the urban camping ban. Debbie Ortega. Same question? Yeah, where, where would you look to put a safe use site? The one site that we currently have today that's the harm reduction site. Thank you. So we are here tonight at McAuliffe International School where a good number of the students are gonna go on to East High, mm. where last month a 16-year-old named Luis Garcia was shot to death outside of school. Mm -hmm. Luis had written a poem titled My City. He wrote, it's not what it seems to be. It's not just hanging out with friends going downtown. It's getting shot because you were at the wrong place, wrong time. So certainly Denver's young people know the danger to their own lives, and one of you is going to be in a unique position to help as mayor. Terrence Roberts, you, you rose to prominence in Denver as a former gang member who did time then came back to the community as an anti-violence activist. You recently told me that, that the gang just happened to be the negative peer influence or peer group that you were around when you were growing up, and that a negative peer group could be a football team or a sorority or a fraternity. I think people understand what you're saying about different kids having different upbringings, but does that diminish what's going on with gangs in Denver when you say stuff like that? No, definitely not. Um, most people who that are in gangs are not, all studies have been showing this for decades. Most people that are in gangs, it's, it's, it's for a community versus they want to go rob little old ladies and, and do violence to people. Most members of gangs are not violent people. It's very, it's actually a smaller percentage of people that are committing the actual violent crimes that are part of those communities. It is a community. If a 12-year-old child has nothing to do after school but a 38-year-old man or woman does in, in, in Lodo or somewhere else, that's a problem in this city. We don't have enough after-school programs. If, if the Crips or the Bloods are cooler and tougher than your after-school program, guess what your son's probably going to be if they don't have anything to do? Guess who your daughter's going to be thinking is cool to date? Somebody who's probably a damaged child who needs services themselves. So no, it doesn't um, diminish um, saying that because there are negative peer groups besides gangs. We just dump everything onto these youth and it's not fair to them. Thank you. Andy Rougeau, uh, apart from your pledge to hire more Denver police officers, which you've talked about tonight, and the majority of candidates on the stage, by the way, have said that they wanna hire more Denver police officers. What else will you do to keep Denver's young people safe from violence? So Denver's young people right now are not safe. There was a father and a daughter driving home down I-25 South. They're coming back from a volleyball practice. 
normal time of night, and the dad looks in his rearview mirror and he sees two cars zooming way over the speed limit. Driver's side window, front windshield shattered into glass. It was street racers shooting at each other right by Mile High Stadium, I-25. We had multiple people killed by street racers last year. And the reason why we're having this rise in violence is one, a lack of police officers. That's why we need to have those former police officers. It's a lack of funding for our police, for police training. It's also a 911 system that's broken. Because right now, if you call 911, there's a 25% chance you'll sit on hold for more than 30 seconds. On one of those worst moments in your life, you will sit there and hear that dial tone ring and ring. So that's why Denver deserves a mayor who will fight for a future, who will actually add former police officers, not subtract them, who will increase funding for police and make sure our 9 system works. Thank you. Lisa Calderon, you have been very clear that when it comes to public safety, you don't think more police means more public safety, but that community safety initiatives can really help. So what role do Denver police and the city play in addressing youth violence? Right. It's not just my belief. It's actually supported by research that more police doesn't necessarily equate to more safety. Um, what does are things that like housing. When we know people are housed, they can be stabilized and we can find them. Um, you know, I've trained law enforcement for 20 years. Uh, around domestic violence and then also working for eight years in the jail. And uh, what I hear from them is they do not want to be sweeping people. They want to be solving crimes. They want to do the jobs that they were hired to do. Um, so what we need to do actually is uh, reinvest from having officers sweep people to actually having crisis intervention responders working around people with their trauma. That would leave police officers free to solve crimes rather than pick on unhoused and poor people. So you were chief of staff to City Councilwoman Candy Sidibaka when she proposed abolishing the Denver Police Department and replacing it with a peace force. Yes or no, do you support that idea? Uh, no, and I didn't know it was coming up, actually. Um, but I support the idea of transforming our public safety system. So that I do support. I was part of the Reimagining Policing uh, Task Force, where we made 112 recommendations of how to transform policing. So, you know, I support the idea, the, the idea that she was working toward for a peace force, meaning that we should not have to use um, violent policing to go after protesters and pay $14 million in a settlement, for example. Um, so we start with the goal that we want and we work backwards. That, that data is wrong because more police do lead to more safety. It is not we, wrong, we, Andy. We saw from and actually, we saw from and President actually Obama. you probably need to do more research so, uh, let me, let me tell you than about making blanket statements. Okay, hold, 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 hold trying to always talk over people. And ask President the folks in the audience don't to hold on. what you're talking okay. about. Nobody can hear either of you when you yes. talk over each other or when people clap. So what we're going to do is, if you'd like to take 15 <laughs> seconds to make your point, and then you can respond. So President Obama had a stimulus in 2009, increased funding for police. Academic studies show that decreased violence per additional police officer by five less violent crimes and 11 less property crimes per year. That's a clear example of more police making the city safer. So look up Vera Institute, look up Sentencing Project, look up many other studies that show that, and particularly for communities of color, which I know you are less familiar with, more policing does not equal more safety. And so for us, we have to look at other issues like, again, the social safety social safety net, like affordable housing, like good jobs and unionized jobs. Those are things that bring down the crime rate. So again, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay, thank you. Trinidad Rodriguez. Can I just moderate this debate a little bit? You may not, but second. you're welcome to no. share your views <laughs> and, and here's, about... Uh, and and here's the safe. way we, this, this is the way we come to agreement. I heard what uh, Dr. Calderon said, which is additional police does not necessarily mean more safety. That is not in opposition to what Andy just described, which was specific data, which I agree with. We Ellie, can, we can yep. grow the ranks of our police force and do it the right way and build equity in policing by creating more prevention strategies and, and uh, increasing training uh, because our officers are stretched to the limit given the short staffing we have. And we so hold, hold on, hold on just a quick second. Uh, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna come to Al on this. Workers. But on, on this issue too. of police yeah. training, that is a contrast between several of you here. Anusha has a question about that. 
Chris Hansen, you said you support more training and more accountability for law enforcement as well as reinvesting in public safety. Lisa Calderon has said that Denver police are beyond the point of reform and training and that public safety department needs to be restructured. So why do you think more training, an effort that is currently happening, will be changing how law enforcement operates? Wow. I, I mean, to say that our police department is beyond reform or beyond fixing feels very defeatist to me. Uh, I'm certainly not there. I do think we need to have more investment in training, and I think some of the lawsuits that we've seen that the city's now paying out prove the point. And that's why I think it's such an important part of my public safety plan. But look, we're down several hundred officers in the police department. We're down almost 300 officers in the sheriff's office, and it's creating a, a HR crisis just on the ability for officers to be able to keep up with forced overtime. And that in and of itself is making us less safe because officers are worn out and morale is low. So we have to reinvest in our public safety department. I think it's the number one job as your next mayor to do that. And that's why I'm in favor of getting back up to full strength. That's why I'm in favor of investing from day one when people enter the police academy and we're recruiting them. That's the sort of reinvestment that we need to make and to make sure we don't have a repeat of some of the mistakes of the past. And that's how training can help us move forward. Thank All you. Right. I've heard a lot of the why on this topic. Most of you here tonight have said you want to hire more police officers in Denver. Kelly Bruff, Debbie Ortega, Mike Johnston, Chris Hansen, Andy Rougeau, Trinidad Rodriguez, and Al Gardner have said that. Al Gardner, let's start with you here. You want stronger educational requirements for officers and a higher recruiting age beyond 21. Yes, thank you. As of this month, DPD is short 155 officers with 68 in the academy. I also checked with the Sheriff's Department, which is short 280 deputies with 16 in the academy. How, not the why, but how are you filling these vacancies with stricter educational requirements and raising the recruiting age? Yeah, thank you. And, and as the only candidate on the stage is actively involved in hiring um, police, and uh, I, would, I have a lot to say about that. And the first thing I will say is that it's quite easy to say we'll boost these numbers um, to 400, 600, whatever you want to throw out there. However, as we look at the pipeline of candidates that come through the civil service office and the amount of intricate investigation that goes on in hiring these officers, it's not a quick turn and burn operation. And to answer the question how to change it, we simply put the screws around it to make those changes. As I'm looking at applications, as I'm looking at backgrounds, I'm less inclined to try and hurry up and boost the ranks as I am to make sure that we're getting the right person in the job. And if that means it takes us another three years, another four years to build our ranks, we need to make sure that we're doing it right because the job of policing has indeed changed. And the policing now is not the policing that we had in the 20th or 19th century. Thank you. So I name, I name checked a few of you. So Kelly Bruff, 30 seconds, please. How are you filling hundreds of vacancies when this administration has not? Yeah, I think what we have to focus on, uh, I think the issue for sheriffs may be different than the issue for police. And I think we probably have to distinguish. They're recruited differently. There's different structures. I actually uh, disagree with Al. I think we actually have to look at the Civil Service Commission process and ask the question if it's timely enough and speedy enough. Uh, but I think changing the culture in the police department and being really clear that it's more transparent and more open and people get a better sense of what's happening there both to give feedback to that department and improve its performance, uh, but I also think it will attract more candidates where people get a sense of what the job really looks like because it has changed and it looks significantly different, and I would use that to recruit. Thank you. Debbie Ortega, how are we increasing the staff? So first of all, I want to get young people from our community into these job opportunities. These are good, livable wage jobs. And I want to use the cadet program to recruit young people. It pays four years of college for the young people who come into the cadet program and they get preference points when they choose to apply. The career service, the civil service uh, process doesn't always work. We have kids that go through the program and succeed alongside their peers. And we have seen some of our minority candidates that don't get hired on. So I think we need to look at the equity in the process to make sure that we're not creating disparities, but I want to have a workforce that reflects the diversity of our community. And then on the recruitment side for adults, we need to make sure that 
people from our police department who are doing the recruiting actually show up to these events to do the recruitment. Can I clarify that, please? Real quick. Because, because cadets do not get uh, extra points for being a cadet. Uh, we sat with them about a month ago and went through that entirely. They, have, they are vetted the same way than any applicant is vetted. The city obviously pays for their education, and we appreciate it, but we do not give them preference points. Thank, thank you, Mr. Gardner. Uh, Mike Johnson. Yeah, I think three things. One is changing the job. The two is changing the training, uh, and the three is changing the recruitment. I think on changing the job, when you talk to, talk to retired officers who've done it for 20 years, and they'd say, you know, the first two years of my experience I loved the most, because in those two years I actually was doing real community-based policing. I was out walking a beat, talking to neighbors, building relationships, giving them my card. That's the kind of job people love to have, which is the f real call of being able to serve and protect. And so I think that changes the kind of applicants you require. That means you can actually recruit much more from communities where kids who might not have thought that an officer was a job they wanted to enter. Now it feels like a way you really can serve your community and then you want to be able to I agree with Debbie get as much of a diverse uh, pipeline as you can of folks who come from the communities they're going to be serving and supporting. Thank you. Earlier Chris Hansen you explained why you wanted to hire more police officers. The question is how are you going to actually do that? Yeah I think one of the other things that's missing here is obviously you know we, we talked a little bit about tonight about uh, diversifying the, the pipeline looking at ways to get more applicants in. There's also the culture piece. I mean the officers I talk to are feeling like morale in the department is extremely low. Um, certainly in the sheriff's office in, in particular because of the extra shortages that they're up against right now. And so I think we need a mayor and I will be a mayor who will celebrate great policing. Let's lift up our great policing. Let's lift up our officers and show the tight connection to the community and invest in that tight connection to the community. I think that's ultimately how we turn it around because you think about the, the departments around Denver where people are leaving to. That is a big part of our attrition problem. And we have to be able to stop that. And I think one of the first things we have to do is change that, uh, that culture that the department feels right now. And as the mayor, I want to celebrate and invest in great policing. Andy Rougeau, 155 officers short right now. So that takes your math down to you need 555. And Correct. I guess if we're going to the max of 1,600, it's even shorter than that. So you've got a lot of uh, officers to hire. Yes. How? So when I talk to officers, similar to Chris, you don't hear it's a pay issue. You hear it's a morale issue. You hear it's a lack of support from the mayor. It's a belief they can't do their job. I talked to an officer who said he cannot pursue nonviolent crimes. The example was a car thief he pulls up behind the car, car zooms off through a red light. That officer is under, understandably frustrated. He joined to serve. He joined to be help his community. And he feels like he can't do it. And he obviously gets yelled at by the person who just had the worst day of their life having their car stolen. So having a mayor who will fight for our future, support our officers, and properly fund them will let us meet that gap. Thank you. And Trinidad Rodriguez, I named you also, so 30 seconds of how you're hiring more officers. Uh, improve the job, support good policing, um, <clears throat> uh, staff uh, my cabinet appointments, my director of public safety, with particular competency in growing teams and expanding teams. Now, I want to go a little more in depth because you previously said that you uh, also want to hire a form of security to forcibly hold people inside these involuntary detention facilities that you'll be building for up to 1,000 people experiencing homelessness. Where would you come up with these officers in addition to what you just mentioned about hiring for the city? And the key resource here is clinicians to actually assess people's health conditions, their health stability, uh, whether they're clinically diagnosable with substance and mental health use disorders. The second order is safety and we can um, use, I, I'm actually very interested in working with our governor to explore the Colorado National Guard. And the, uh, in particular, because the US military is right now innovating on mental health struggles among enlisted people. And so I believe we have an opportunity to build a best in class um, standard for how we actually care for people, keep everyone safe, and get them in, trend, uh, and support them into the kind of treatment that you actually need to be able to kick these incredibly difficult to kick uh, mental health and substance use disorders, given the potency of the drugs that are on our streets today. 
Thank you. Wow, I'm, I'm just, I just have to point out that I'm a little bit shocked that first we've gone from internment camps to now calling in the National Guard to forcibly remove people off the streets and put them in And I didn't in, say in, put, any put one of those place, words. We've been talking about his internment camps. I mean, camp this is like, this is. Yeah, no, no, I mean, in, 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 fa in fairness, he, he didn't talk about the National Guard rounding people up, just guarding them once just they're guard, at the camp. Yeah, very fair, no, I, no, Thank so you very I have, much. No, I have, a, I, have a qu I have a question also about police hiring for you. <laughs> so after you passed police reform following George Floyd's murder in 2020, yes. there were a number of reports of Colorado police officers leaving the job mm. because they didn't want to comply with stricter requirements to report misbehavior by other officers, the potential for personal liability if they violate a citizen's civil rights. And to this day, conservative critics blame you personally yeah. yep. for the difficulty in hiring police in Denver and around the state. Mm -hmm. Is this city going to have more trouble hiring and retaining law enforcement if you're the mayor? I don't believe so. For, so I will start by saying, again, I am proud of the police accountability bill that we passed. I'm sorry I left you out, Al. You were definitely there pro, um, not only protesting but testifying, and thank you for bringing your expertise to the table. Um, we can have the best and the brightest on our streets serving and protecting us, and we should demand it. We should demand it. Um, we have seen officer shortages across the country. Colorado is no different, although we're the ones that have ha had accountability. And yes, there are some folks who left, specifically in some of our rural counties that said, I don't wanna be held to these standards. I don't want to have accountability. Step back. And I say, that's probably the right thing for them, because if they don't want to be held accountable to the communities that they're serving, should they be there to protect and serve us? And so for me, uh, I'm proud of the record that we have here in Colorado, and I know that we can have the best and brightest, but everyone deserves to live in a community that is safe. Um, in fact, most recently, my colleague, Senator Rhonda Fields, just had a drive-by happen at our house, and her house was shot up. This is not the answer that we have to live, live with. Instead, we can make sure that we have the number of officers that we need with the mental health training, yes, that we need. But number one thing that I've heard from law enforcement is we need more investigators to get at the root causes of crime, to investigate and break up these rings that are happening across our city, targeting our young people to go into gangs and to commit violence. That's where we need to focus our resources. And quite frankly, that's what they've asked for. Thank you. All of you on stage, with the exception of Thomas Wolfe, have said that Denver should maintain its unofficial status as a sanctuary city that does not cooperate with federal immigration agents. Thomas Wolfe, why should Denver resume cooperation with immigration agents? So it was uh, qualified by when it's a criminal uh, investigation. Um, this, I think this, is, uh, this, this throws a, a very harsh light on a lot of federal policy. Um, including what we do with the EPA here and how we deal with Suncor. Um, we, we need, and of course I would frame it from a um, financial standpoint, with Suncor, if they're breaking the rules, we live in a society where it's cheaper to, to pay for forgiveness than it is to pay for permission. Until you make the behavior um, uneconomic, you're not gonna get the change. That was, I feel like he took a side, side turn somewhere. A little bit of a side it, it, It's about why should you use city resources to help immigration agents? To enforce the law. We need to start enforcing laws in this city. Um, I would go back to encampments. They're the poster child of lawlessness. Um, I'd like to ask uh, the state folks on decriminalizing uh, car theft, what's, how that's helping police officers. Thank you. Debbie Ortega, your public safety plan uh, recycles a lot of what the Hancock administration is doing now. And when we asked you specifically what you would do differently, you said that you want Denver to have a, a, a metro area crime task force. So we counted up at least a half dozen task forces already. There's Raven, a metro task force on gun violence, CMAT, the task force on auto theft, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, there's the Colorado Organized Retail Crime Task Force, DPD has a task force on fentanyl, there's the Metro Gang Task Force, and there's the Safe Streets Task Force for violent offenders. Why is another task force the answer? So I think it's pulling all of these together to make sure that we're working towards getting guns out of our streets, getting the lethal drugs that are killing our kids in our schools, as well as families. And I think, you know, that's, that's my focus. It's to address the crime element that's happening in our city that is, it's undermining our entire community. The drugs that are on our streets are killing people. And, and I'm talking about the, the, what used to be referred to as meth, which is now laced with chemicals that is causing severe mental illness among many of our people on our, on our streets. So that's why those treatment beds become 
absolutely critical to helping those individuals stabilize their lives. So, I mean, uh, the state has a meth task force as well, which I didn't name. I'm trying to figure out, so you want to combine all the task forces into one mega task force, or uh, help me understand that. So I think it's pulling those resources together in a more comprehensive way, so we're having greater impact in addressing these issues. Thank you. And I want to mention, I was actually on the meth task force and uh, uh, when I worked in the Ritter administration. And what I will say is that we did not decrease meth use in the state. And it was pretty much a PR thing that happened um, with that task force. And so as we step back, and, and I'm, I am uh, proud of the work that we did, not because we moved that forward, but because I learned when I was early in my career how to build bridges. So when we talk about police accountability, I want to be clear that law enforcement did not oppose the bill. In fact, they were neutral. Denver came to the table and worked on the bill with us. I think I think that's so important. But what Debbie is trying to say about needing to come in and use these task forces to hone in on what the criminology is that is happening right now that's affecting the majority of Denver rights, that's not wrong. But we've got to make sure that those task forces are held accountable and that they provide real outcomes for people. Thank you. Mike Johnson and Kelly Ruff, I'd like to bring you into this conversation uh, and kind of turn it back to the idea of, of safety of students the ones here at McAuliffe East elsewhere. There are some East High students who have asked for the return of Denver police officers as school resource officers, SROs. It's not their choice. Uh, it wouldn't be your choice as mayor either. It's up to the school board. It's up to the school district. Both of you have said that you want the mayor to be more vocal in getting involved in school board races. Even if you are successful in pushing progressive members off the school board, you're talking about years away in the future. So what could you do as mayor before the start of the next school year to keep DPS kids safe? Kelly Bruff first, please. Uh, yeah, well, I've already started. Uh, I've met with, uh, I think, maybe every school board member today to talk with them about, does it really have to be a uniform policy that says no school can have a school resource officer, but why couldn't you make it the school's decision where the families and the students are deciding what they want? Because in my conversations throughout the city, I would say there are a number of schools who are begging for school resource officers. I also th think it could be an additional way that you start to attract and recruit uh, people who might want to be police officers someday. Mike Johnston. Yeah, I think there are three things we have to do here. One is you got to start with prevention. You got to make sure kids have access to more positive after school and summer school programming to keep kids from getting into violence on the front end. We have to do more early intervention. We got to make sure once we identify kids who have at risks of criminal activities, you're getting them deep support and wraparound services. And the third is, yes, I do think you need to be able to provide schools the safety that they want. I was a school principal. Uh, school principals and school communities should be able to make that decision. And so what I've said is I think the school board shouldn't take an ideological stand to deny parents or community members the ability to have safety if they are worried about their kids getting shot at schools. Uh, I think that's something the community should be able to make. And I've said if the school board would not do that, I would work directly with DPD to try to deploy officers to those schools if the school board won't do that. And you believe that the school board's position on this is ideological and not based on research on things like the school to prison pipeline? I do. I worked for a superintendent who said we'll let school principals choose. So I chose to put a social worker into my school instead of a, uh, a school resource officer because that was the right decision for our community, our kids at that time. If I just had one of my students killed outside of my school, I would feel differently. Thank you. The state legislature right now is considering a measure that would give municipalities the ability to try rent control if they so choose. Most of you oppose Denver introducing some form of rent control. We're going to show the folks at home where you stand on this. Kelly Bruff has said no to this along with Chris Hansen, Mike Johnston, Debbie Ortega, Trinidad Rodriguez, Andy Rougeau, and Thomas Wolfe. Those of you in favor of some form of rent control are Lisa Calderon, Al Gardner, and Terrence Roberts. And Leslie Harrod has repeatedly declined to take a position on this on our candidate questionnaire in an interview and in previous forums. So Leslie Harrod, you're likely to be voting on this soon in the state legislature. So given that Denver voters are receiving their ballots starting today. Might you give them a sneak preview of your position <laughs> before you vote publicly in the legislature on the issue of municipalities opting into rent control? Absolutely. And um, when we filled out that questionnaire, the conversation was very much still happening in the House uh, and the bill was under amendments. And I choose not to commit unless I am a part of that amendment process on any specific bill. But I did vote for that bill. Uh, and so that is my vote. I voted yes um, to allow municipalities to have some type of rent stabilization uh, policies in our city. Look, we need 50,000 more units of real, truly affordable housing today. That's below market rate for people who are living in the city today. Um, we also need to make sure that if you're a mom trying to make ends meet, that you don't get a notice that your rent is going up by $300, $400 the next month. We can't afford that right now. So it's I just untenable. want to be clear. 
So to you, be clear, you support municipalities trying it and you support Denver trying it because it's a two step process. So to be clear, I voted yes on the bill to ensure that municipalities have the option to have the conversation. Denver should have this on the table as we're considering all that we should do. And again, I'll point folks to my website. We have plans on on our website today where we have hundreds of units today in vacant lots that we can build for the people of Denver and we can build them at below market rate. That is the priority. Thank you. Kelly Bruff, I've heard you talk about building affordable housing on surface parking lots, including rec centers. I haven't heard you talk about going to voters. Denver City Charter bans the sale or lease of any yeah. parks property with few exceptions that require it to be a parks purpose. So it sounds like you're aware of the part of city charter. So what part of your plan involves asking voters to remove that ban? Yeah, I mean, I think it becomes if we do decide that we want to build on rec centers and the parking lot is part of the park land or not. And that's just the piece I have to check further. But I've talked about it as libraries, police stations, firehouses, partnering with Denver Public Schools, RTD, the state of Colorado and the federal government. So I think there's lots of parking lots that we can work on that don't require a vote. I just noticed rec centers always came first. Oh, uh, sorry. I'll flip, I'll switch order. Councilwoman Robin Kanich recently wrote, candidates are mistaken in thinking Denver is sitting on acres of empty lots to build affordable housing. Inventories have been done, only a handful of lots for residential were found, and most have already been sold or leased for affordability. Do you know of lots that she doesn't? No, she's correct. That's why I'm focused on the parking lots, is we don't have a ton uh, of vacant, uh, empty space with nothing on it. Uh, Leslie, I heard you say it earlier, about yeah. one minute ago, 15 seconds. Where are these lots that... Yeah, there's 60 plus lots that we have um, we have identified working in partnership with some folks who are doing this out in community uh, that have developed a tech platform that overlays uh, zoning and residential commercial um, restrictions in the city over city lots, city owned lots. And we have identified 60 lots that can be utilized for things like affordable housing, like creative space. I created the Middle Income Housing Authority to at the state level to ensure we have more housing options for teachers, firefighters, nurses. That's also in the plan. Debbie Ortega, you talk about building modular homes on publicly owned land that will cost 40% less because you take the land value out of the equation. You've also touted a company from England to make these homes. Thomas Wolf said he's ready to invest if you can pull it off, but he doesn't think it's possible. Help me understand a couple things. How does the math work? And is it appropriate to plug this one private company from England when there are local companies that can factory build modular homes? So this is using a completely different technology than what is being used today by any of the manufacturing companies that are in Colorado. This gentleman has been here. The company is called Lattice. He's met with some of the other manufactured housing companies. And the reality is it's the technology that allows the product to be produced much quicker. And it will also train and upskill individuals at the same time. So. The cost would be 40% less because you have a fixed cost of your materials and your labor. And where you have public lands, you take the land cost out. So the goal is to do for sale rental and um, it can be multifamily as well. And briefly, because I heard Mike Johnson say he doesn't want to tip his hand about Broncos uh, anything. Why would you tip your hand to a company that says, if I'm mayor, you're coming in with me? I want a technology that is going to produce the product much quicker so that we can bring the affordability online that is bringing it at a lower price point than what anybody else is doing in the market today. 30 seconds, Thomas Wolf. why don't you believe this? Uh, let's see, there's about a trillion dollars that gets deployed into, you know, it's one of the four food groups of, of uh, institutional investment into property. I'm pretty sure those guys take a pretty close look at what is the most productive way of doing this, the most competitive. That's the, that's the opportunity with the free market is that somebody's always trying to do better than the next guy. When your city is trying to do it, it always takes longer, costs more, and is much more inefficient. Thank you. So can I just counter that? 15 seconds. So this is utilizing the technology and the reason he had the conversations with our other manufactured facilities in Colorado was to see if they were willing to utilize that technology. If they're not, then that's why we want to build this manufactured facility here in Colorado to meet the need in the demand. Thank you very much. A few of you are specifically campaigning on the idea of making Denver's strong mayor system less powerful, in particular Terrence Roberts and Lisa Calderon. We have not yet attempted a show of hands in this debate because it can be a little bit messy, but let's try it. <laughs> Denver mayor may currently serve three terms. Please raise your hand if you would pledge to serve no more than 
two terms as mayor. For folks who might have difficulty with the visuals, I'm going to say everyone here is making the pledge with the exception of Andy Rougeau. You wanna give me 15 seconds on why not? So our city is suffering from serious issues, rising crime, homelessness, cost of housing. I don't know how long it's gonna to take to fix those issues, but it's gonna take us a while to bail us out of it. Fair enough. There are 17 candidates on the ballot. Please raise your hand if you would pursue changes to the city charter to make it harder for people to get on the ballot to run for Denver mayor. Hands raised if you would make it harder to run for Denver mayor. All the way up, please. Two of you, that is Trinidad Rodriguez and Thomas Wolf. Last question of the debate. Please raise your hand if you would pursue ranked choice voting or approval voting instead of the current runoff system. Rodriguez, Calderon, Hansen, uh, Roberts, Mike Johnson, Al Gardner, Kelly Bruff, and Leslie Harrod. Thank you all for that and guessing by the applause behind us, folks like that quite a bit as well. <laughs> That wraps up the second of three Nine News debates in the race for Denver mayor. Our next debate will be after the two-person runoff is determined. Good night.